Our speaker today will be Michelle Taylor, um, and I just wanted to uh, introduce her for you. Um, she's the Vice President of Student Affairs, and Michelle Taylor was appointed as Vice President at, of U, uh, U Student Affairs at Utah Valley University in June 2013. Her 18-year career in higher education with her specialty in social work administration and policy has helped the institution navigate several major transitions. Prior to her present appointment, she served for three years as Associate Vice President of Enrollment Management and six years as Associate Vi Vice President of Student Services slash the Dean of Enrollment Management. Following her graduation from the University of Utah with Masters of Social Work, MSW, in 1995, Taylor worked as the Director of Accessibility Services at Utah Valley State College. At that same institution, she accepted the position of Associate Dean of Student Services, American Disability Act Campus Coordinator. After earning her Master's of Public Policy Administration, MPA, and Social Work Administration, PhD, in 2002, she became the Acting Vice President of Planning, Information Technology, and Student Services, slash the Acting Dean of Student Services. Throughout her career, Taylor has initiated a wide range of strategies for the benefit of students and the academy. She, has been trusted, she had been a trusted friend and advocate of students, focusing on students with diverse backgrounds and learning disabilities. She has co-written and secured grants for over millions of dollars, serves on multiple boards and committees, and presents at national and international conferences annually. She has received many honors and awards, including the Outstanding Professional Adjunct of the Year and Excellence in Leadership. She was also awarded the UVU Board of Trustees Award of Excellence. Please welcome Michelle Taylor. <laughs> It's so great to be here today. Hopefully all of you can, can hear me. You all look so professional. You look like, you definitely look like leaders. Well, my quest in trying to figure out how to communicate well uh, started back when I was in high school. Um, that was my first experience of, of having a leadership opportunity and having it not go well. So that's when I first felt like, wow, I really need to figure out this whole communication thing. Uh, it's a lot harder than it looks. And I, I graduated from college in 1983, so I've been working full time for 30 years. I still haven't figured it out. I'm still working on it, but I'm a lot better than I was before. So just to tell you a little bit about myself, let's see if I can get this to work. Oh, it does work. My first leadership opportunity was at Box Elder High, the Mighty Bees, um, in Brigham City. And uh, I, I was elected to a student body office. That's me on the right. Do you like my 70s hair? It's pretty awesome. Um, anyway, I, that was my first experience. And I was so excited about it. It was, it was just the coolest. And the first project that I was assigned was homecoming. So we each had projects, mine was homecoming, and, um, and every time I'd meet with the committee, and we had a lot of people on the committee, there was probably 30 people uh, on the committee, uh, I'd go through all the assignments that needed to be done, you know, who's, okay, have you got the, the band for the dance? No. Have you got, you know, the, have, what about the game, is it, is it all set up, what about the tailgating, is it set up? No. I am just thinking, wow. This is so hard. What about the parade? Have you got the parade set up? No. <laughs> I'm like, OK. It's getting closer and closer. I'm trying everything I can think of. I'm, you know, I'm talking to people, and I'm trying to be as nice as I can. And, um, and nothing is getting done. And I'm just like so frustrated. And finally, about a week before, I just like totally lost it. And I just totally lost my temper. And I just started yelling at them. I mean, I just yelled at them. And by gosh, they got their stuff done. And it turned out awesome. And everyone hated my guts. And that whole year, they hated my guts. And I was just like devastated. Because I was like, what the heck? How do you do this? Um, because I'd never had an experience with leadership before. And everything that had worked on in, in church projects and in volunteer projects didn't work. 
And the only thing that worked was when I was someone that I didn't even like. And, and I felt really, really badly about it. So my, um, my advisor, you might recognize this advisor. My advisor was Rob Bishop. He's uh, a representative now uh, in Congress. But at the time, he was, he was a debate coach. He was my debate coach. He was also, he helped us with student government. And, um, and he says, oh, he, he does an evaluation after each activity and uh, to evaluate the leader. And, and I got, and they're all, they don't have names on them, so I got my evaluations back. And I mean, they suck, like bad. Like there are words on there I've never heard before. And they were all calling me. And, um, and I'm just devastated. And I'm just like, Bishop, that's what we called him. It's like, I, I don't know what to do. I think I'm going to have to resign. Because I'm not, I'm not I, I don't have what it takes to do this. Um, everyone hates my guts. Um, they're not talking to me. Um, I, I just feel like I've just messed everything up and I just need to resign. And he said, oh my gosh, you're not going to resign. You've made a mistake. You're going you're to figure it out and you're going to learn from it. And he said, this is a great experience for you. You figured out what not to do. You figured out that this was not a good way to do something. And so I remember thinking, well, yeah, that's true. I did get that part down, <laughs> that whatever I did, which was completely lose my temper, um, was not the way that I wanted to be a good leader. And it was not the way that I could be remembered as a good leader. And so I decided I never want to do that again. I, don't, I need to figure out what the heck I'm supposed to do, but I know that's not the way. And one of the things that he said to me ha has always stayed with me. And that is, you are judged as a leader on your worst days, not your best days. And so you've got to figure out, when you have your very worst day, you are exhausted, and you are tired, and you are overwhelmed, and you have no idea how you're going to get something done. Those are the days you're judged, not on your best day. Because when we're having a good day, it's awesome. You're the best leader. You're so understanding, and you listen to people, and you're, you're able to talk through difficult problems, all those kind of things. But then on your worst day, and your evil twin comes out, that's what you don't want to be remembered for. So I would have to say, since that time, I have spent a good 30 years trying to develop my communication skills so that I can be the type of leader that is remembered um, as being as, as good on my worst day as on my best day. Now, I have not always succeeded, and I'm the first one to tell you that. Now, we're going to go through some examples um, some poor examples of mine uh, so that we can kind of talk about those. But one thing, another thing that um, Rob Bishop said to me that I always remembered is he says, he said, he, he said, leadership is a grappling sport. Now, at that time in my life, I didn't know what grappling was. Anyone know what grappling is? Hey, we have someone here that knows what grappling is. So... Do I have to say what it is? Yeah, would you please? Okay. <laughs> Let me say it first. Okay, say it okay. first, then we'll so, reward later. Right, what, I, what I know grappling to be is, is from, it's, it's, like, it's almost like wrestling, but it's more like takedowns and stuff. Okay. I, I think that deserves a reward for That's sure. Right. <laughs> okay. So anyone else want to add to that? Grappling masters out there? Okay. out or they pass out and so basically you're down on the ground and like you're in a lock with these two people until one of them cries uncle <laughs> right or they pass out so they can't cry uncle for sure we've got one more so go ahead tell us what grappling is all about um, my experience in grappling grappling is all about control not only controlling like your opponent but being able to control yourself mm -hmm. Hey, I think we have a wrestler in the room. By any chance, have you, are you a wrestler? I did jiu-jitsu growing up. You did jiu-jitsu. Okay. So, um, so at that time in my life, I didn't know what grappling was. It just so happens that, that my son um, 
became a grappling champion. He became a, a world champion several times in grappling. So grappling is, uh, it, it is judo, it is wrestling, and it is jujitsu. And it's all about controlling yourself. And when you control yourself, you're able to actually control the other person and use their weight against them. So I want to just give you an example. Ah, uh, got to point it at the right thing. So here's some examples of some grappling. So you can see that it's not really that easy. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't usually fly to people's heads <laughs> when I'm trying to work with them. Um, or, you know, I'm upside down. But you know, when you're in leadership, it is just like this. And the higher up you go in leadership, the more uncomfortable it gets. All of a sudden, you have to become very comfortable in uncomfortable situations. Now, when I was just when I was a director, um, yes, I had uh, I had problems every day in as far as as the department, and those problems were difficult to solve. But nothing compared to when I moved up and I had um, and I had more than one department underneath me, or then I moved up to where I have 600 employees underneath me. Every single day there is an uncomfortable conversation that has to take place. And if you don't get to a point where you can be comfortable in those very uncomfortable situations, you're not going to do well at leadership. And so what I learned, what I've learned in the past 30 years, is I've, I've started to learn how to use my conversation as a tool to help ground myself. I am the only one that is responsible for my actions. And how can I use that to ground myself and only focus on what I can do to change? Because can you change another person? Anyone have a two-year-old? You, you can't change that person. You can force them when they're little, not for very long. Um, you can force them, but as they become an adult, you can't force them to do anything. You can influence them. You can use your, um, you can you can use all your influence, your knowledge, your ability to help them uh, work with you. But you can't force them to work with you. So some of the books that have helped me the very most, I started with um, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and that's this is one that I started with right after uh, right after college or right after high school. I started with this book uh, as soon as it came out. And it really, really helped me a lot. And in fact, I still use it as a framework. And I'll talk to you about that framework and, and how, I use, uh, how I use that. Um, the next book that I have really used, and I'll be talking about the concepts in, these, in, in each of these books, is leadership and, self, in, and self-deception. Uh, the beautiful thing about this book is it talks about how often we tell stories to ourselves that just aren't true. We think that everything we think in our little brains is true, and it's not. We, we think all kinds of things that aren't true, and, and we, think of all, we think of all kinds of things that, um, that set our way and set the tone of how we communicate, and it may really be hurting us. So, and it's all based on perception. Um, now, Covey talks a lot about perception. The, that perspective and that perception and, and how you act from that. And so does this book. And I really love the depth that this book goes in. But let me just give you an example of what this book is talking about. How many of you have read this book? So quite a few of you. That's great. Um, one example of just things that we tell ourselves that aren't true. For example, I was standing in uh, the bus line before I, usually I'll take the train, not all the time, but but I try and take the train, especially on a, on a very cold day or a really icy day, I'll take the train. Um, but anyway, this was before the train was, was going. And so I was standing in the bus line. There was tons of people that day. It must have been the beginning of the semester <laughs> when everyone comes. And um, anyway, so I'm in this line. And everyone's like jostling. And there's, like, there's all these people around. They're all trying to get on the bus. I'm right in the middle of it. And I have some guy behind me who keeps like touching me. Okay, now ladies, do you like it when guys that you don't know start touching you? No. 
what are, what are some things you think of when guys that you don't know start touching you? Okay, I know you think. Yes. Uh, creeper? Creeper? Creeper status. Oh, yes, absolutely. Creeper. <laughs> What's another thing that you think of? What about the P word? Pervert. It's like, I don't like this. Um, this isn't making me happy. Uh, you know, first of all, and I, I know we're jostling, we're jostling back and forth, so, so I, I understand that. But, you know, first he has his hand on my, on my waist. I'm going, okay. Then it moves down to my hip. I'm like, I'm not liking this at all, but we're all smashed together. Then it moves down to my butt, and I'm like mad. I am like so mad. And I just turn around because I'm thinking, this guy is a creep. And he is trying to take advantage of me, and I am going to. And I turned around, and just as I turned around, I saw out of the corner of my eye um, a stick for a blind person. And I'm like, oh, he's lost his stick. <laughs> he's not a creeper. So I reached down, I got his stick, and I turned around, and I reached for his hand. I gave him his stick. We're set. I had been telling myself something that wasn't true. I had been telling myself, hey, there's a creepy guy who's touching me, and I don't like it, and so how did I act towards him? Hostile, really hostile. Like, I was thinking of grappling moves. I can't do those, but I was thinking of them. It's like, I'm so mad. But then immediately when I realize, hey, I'm not thinking the correct thing, I was able to immediately change so that it was a total win-win situation. No, I was able to hand him his stick. He's happy, I'm happy. We're all happy here. Um, but so many times we start telling ourselves these stories that we believe are true, and so we start acting in a very hostile manner before we ever even know what the problem is. And that's one of the things that I really loved about this book is the depth that it goes into on that. Then the last two books are Critical Conversations and critical confrontations. Now, when I moved into um, an associate vice president role, and I have been an associate vice, I was associate vice president for 10 years, all of a sudden I realized, wow, I've developed some good skills, but not enough. I, I do not have enough skills to do this job. And I was able to, to um, find these two books that came highly recommended, and I read both of them all the way through. I love them. I put them on my iPad so that I could reread them and reread them and reread them, especially if I was having a very difficult conversation. They were very, very helpful. Now, what all four of these books talk about are these principles. I just put it in a little nutshell. And that is to balance courage and consideration. So one of the things that is so interesting about these books, the Crucial Conversations books, is that these researchers followed 200 uh, administrators and just watched them. They decided, we're, we're going to do a, a research study. We're going to watch these um, CEOs, vice presidents, um, owners of businesses, uh, people that are in, in powerful leadership positions. We're going to watch them and see what they do. What is it that they do that got them to this place? And so, um, and so they, they did. They, watched, they would watch people for several months, and, and they would um, take their notes. And what they found was that in every single situation, a person that was, now you can have a leader that people didn't think uh, was a very good leader. You could have that. But the people that had reviews of this is an excellent leader, this is an exceptional leader, they did something, all of them, and what they did is that they said things that had to be said, difficult, hard things that had to be said. They were willing to talk about the elephant in the room, but they were willing to do it with respect and consideration. That was the difference. Because I think all of us can think of someone that is willing to say anything, but it may not be with the most respect and consideration. And so if people did either one of them without the balance, they were not considered an effective leader. So if they had tons of courage, 
And they said anything they wanted, but it was not with respect. They were not considered a great leader. If they were so considerate that they never said no, they never said, hey, we have a problem here, we have to work on it, they never talked about the uncomfortable things that have to be talked about, they were not considered a good leader. And that's what I thought, oh my gosh, that is exactly what I needed. So I've read these books over and over and over. Like I say, I have them on my iPad. If I'm going into an exceptionally difficult meeting, I'll go back and I'll read passages of those books. Um, the next thing is that they provide safety. Um, so let me, let me give you an example of that. Um, before I was the vice president, my vice president, whom I reported to, um, sometimes we didn't always agree. And I was always like, um, how do I do this? How do I disagree with my boss? And um, in a way that is, that is productive. So after going through these books several times, I recognized, oh my gosh, I can do this. And the way, the way I did it, and, and my boss and I had a great relationship. Uh, we, had, we had a fantastic relationship. But when I did disagree, um, what I did is I always let him know that I understood that it was his choice. So if it's, if it's his choice or her choice, they get to make the decision and you disagree with it, it's okay to say that. You can say, I disagree and it's for these reasons, but I want you to know that I understand that this is your decision. And whatever decision you make, I'll be on board with that. So to provide that safety, um, it just opens up everything. Because suddenly, you can say anything you need to say. Now, do you need to say it with respect and consideration? Yes, you do. You don't just go on Facebook and say, na 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 um, that's, not, that's not respect and consideration. You go to that person in private and you say, here are the things that I disagree with. But I also want you to know that I understand this is your choice. And one of the things that my boss always knew about me is when I walked out of that, that room, if we'd made a decision or if he or she had made a decision that I didn't agree with but was their responsibility to make, they never heard me say, I disagree with this, or I'm not on board with this. It was, this is what we're going to do, and this is why. And then the last one is be careful with self-betrayal. Okay, Self-betrayal, again, is when you're starting to tell yourself stories that aren't true about another person. All of a sudden, they become the enemy. And so because they're the enemy, you treat them hostile. And whenever you go off treating someone hostile immediately, you lose the ability to work in a way that, that both of you can benefit by. So let's just talk about some examples of these. So again, recapping, successful leaders, they have courage. They have enough courage that they can speak their mind, they can talk about uncomfortable things, and they can be comfortable in uncomfortable situations. But at the same time, they have consideration. They are seeking to listen with respect, and they're treating the other person with respect. Super hard to do. When someone's yelling at you, what do you want to do back? <laughs> Did you say leave? OK, leave. You want to escape, for sure. Who wants to yell back? OK, either way, if fight or flight, that's, that's in our DNA. Most of us, we're not programmed because of our survival, our need to survive, we're not programmed to, to talk it out. And yet, here we are in this generation when that is what we need to do. So I'm going to give some examples here. This is kind of hard to see, so maybe you can see it better on your handout. But on this side over here, it talks about courage. If you have, that you can kind of see where you're at. If you have very high courage and you have low consideration, so if you had high consideration or high courage and low consideration, how you would act. So let me just go to this next one, which actually, this one is what we're going to talk about right now is low courage and low consideration. So we're going to talk about this box right here. So this is generally considered a lose-lose box. Um, because anytime you have low, con low courage, low consideration, that's where you're at. You're in a whole lose-lose scenario. 
So let me just give you an example of a total lose-lose. Um, anyone been watching TV lately and, and, saw, and, and see what's happening with our government? Wouldn't you say that's a lose-lose? For sure. Um, because both of them are saying it's their fault, it's their fault, it's their fault. Whenever you're starting to say it's all their fault, you're already in a lose-lose place. Um, but we can't fix that. We can only fix ourselves. So let's talk about when we get into a lose-lose situation. So I'm going to just give you an example. Um, sometimes a lose-lose situation is when someone just disappears. So they don't have the courage to say, hey, I can't do this assignment. And they don't have the consideration to say, I can't do the assignment. They just disappear. How many of you have had that happen to you? OK, a lot of you have had that happen to you. Um, How did it make you feel? Do you feel like I'm stressing the individual who just disappears because they didn't have courage or consideration for you? Oh, absolutely. Do you want to work with that person again? I don't. They say, oh, you can have this person on your committee. You're like, no thanks. It's just a total lose-lose. But it's not just in work environments. Here's, here's one that happened that, that I did, and I was completely responsible for, a lose-lose. So I'm teaching a 7 a.m. class, which is so bad, because I'm not a morning person. And so I have now made a commitment to myself, no more 7 a.m. classes. Because you, you go in as the instructor, you're trashed, they're trashed, everyone's trashed. <laughs> so it's towards the end of the semester. I am tired. It's Friday. I don't have enough sleep. Um, just exhausted. I'm overwhelmed. Um, my husband takes me to the, the train station. And, um, and it's just it's just a bad day. Just a bad day. And as I, get out of, as I get out of the truck to go get to the train, he said, have a fun day. I'm like, really? You think my days are fun? OK, I go right into self-betrayal. He says, really, you think my days are fun? My husband is a very nice person, by the way. And he's like, I just wanted you to have a fun day. <laughs> I'm like, no, you don't. You don't want me to have a fun day. You think that my job isn't important. You don't think that what I do is as important as what you do. He's like, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. You think that all I do is have fun with my friends at work and go get my nails done and just talk and, and eat out at lunch. That's what you think I do. He's like, no, that's not what I think you do. Yes, it is. Just because you do this really cool, important job, he investigates fraud and offshore banking, you think that what you do is so much more important than I do. Well, I just want you to know I don't have fun. So I get out, <laughs> slam the door, get on the train. I'm like, I'm not going to have fun because my husband thinks that I just have fun all day. So how do you think my day was that day? You think I had very much fun? Like, because someone said, do you want to go to lunch? No. I don't want to go to lunch. I can't. I have to work. I don't have to have any fun. <laughs> so the whole day, I'm just like mad. I'm totally mad because I'm thinking, again, I'm in total self-betrayal, thinking something that's completely not true. My husband just thinks I have fun every day. So then, how do you think our night was that night? <laughs> it wasn't that great. So he picks me up from the train. He's like this awesome person. <laughs> I feel really bad for him because I'm not the easiest person to live with sometimes. And he says, hey, do you want to go to a movie tonight? No, I don't want to go to a movie. I can't have any fun. I brought all my work home and I've got to work. OK, that's fine. You work. In fact, he's like, please work. You know, he's backing off. So that night. I'm just like, I get out my work, and I'm working really hard. And gosh dang it, I'm not going to have any fun. So it's like the next morning I wake up, and I'm like, that is so stupid. Why did I do that? But it took me, it took me almost 24 hours to recognize I was in a total lose-lose. And my gosh, I study this stuff. 
But it took me 24 hours to figure it out, and then I had to go to my husband and apologize. I'm sorry, I don't know what got into me. I know that you don't think that. He's, he's awesome. He's just like, it's no problem, you were overtired. Okay, but the problem is, my husband's gonna understand, but your boss may not understand. Or someone that down the road could give you a promotion may not understand when you go into some kind of craziness when you're doing self-betrayals. Um, the best part of that whole story is the following week, um, my, my husband lets me off and he forgets. And he says, have a fun day. And then he goes, no, don't have a fun day. <laughs> and there's this guy that's walking to get on the train and he hears it and he's like, dude, let your wife have a little fun. <laughs> anyway, you, you can see how you can just get into these total lose-lose with people you love and care about, and you don't want to do that. So how many of you have gotten into a major lose-lose before, and would you be willing to tell about? You'll be able to choose one of these books if you're willing to tell about this. Awesome. Which book would you like? Um, let's go with that one that you got your hand on. This one? This is a very good book. Okay, tell us about your lose-lose. Um, for me, I, I have really high consideration and very low courage. I'm really, really bad at that. I'm always telling people I can do stuff for them all the time. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the time to help people out like I think I do. Right. Um, I used to think I was loud enough. But I Sorry, guess not. Guess not. <laughs> I guess I am kind of in the front. Um, and I was working for an organization um, and I was actually working for the Red Cross. And I, I kept telling them that I could, I could do a lot of classes for them, and a lot, a lot of classes teaching all kinds of cool stuff, everything from teaching how to babysit. For some reason, people don't know how to do that. I don't know why. <laughs> it's um, important. To just even simple CPR stuff. And I just got way behind. I got to where I wasn't prepared for classes to the point where it was just like I was basically calling people last second to be... Like, you know what, hey, will you do this for me? Because I'm just not prepared, and it's right. not going to go well. Right. And in the end, it just, it really came back to bite me. I mean, I'm still in great standing with them, but it just made my respect as with other teachers go down a lot until I really had to work really hard to earn it back. Absolutely. That's a perfect example. Thank you so much for sharing that. Maybe you better get that so it doesn't scream or mic scream to each other. <laughs> so thank you. I love that example. I would bet that every one of you have a lose-lose story. Um, I have quite a few of them. I only shared one. I have so many. But, um, but the trick is, is that you have to start recognizing sooner. Um, I mean, I can't tell you why it took me 24 hours to figure out I was in a total lose-lose with my husband. All I can say is my evil <coughs> twin took over my body, and you know, it took me 24 hours to, to get out of the spell. Um, but the trick is, is you don't want to be there for a week or a month or a year. You can totally ruin your chances of moving up easily in a week or a month or a year. You need to be able to recognize that as soon as possible. You know, preferably in the next few hours. Okay, if you don't recognize in the next few hours, at least in a day, recognize. Because you can, you can make a lot of mistakes and you can apologize and really change those mistakes. But if you don't even recognize them, that's when you're really, um, you really have a problem, is when you don't even recognize that you're doing them. Okay, so let's look at our next one. So now we're gonna talk about high consideration and low courage, which you talked a little bit about. So when you have high, high consideration, you're willing to just go ahead and say yes, 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 even when you're thinking no, 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 no. Are you thinking of an example back there? Uh, no, I'm thinking more of the opposite, like the high courage that I can do. Okay, I'll come back to you for that one. Okay, so let me give you an example of a high consideration of low courage. I had an employee that worked for me, and every time I would ask her to do something for me, she'd get really angry. She'd get angry and defensive, and it was so uncomfortable that I just stopped asking. So I just did it myself. So if I needed something done, okay, I'm just going to figure this out on my own because it's so uncomfortable to, to ask her. 
So what do you suppose happened after months of me just taking it on? Say it again. Resentment. Resentment. Oh, I love that word. Yes, tons of resentment. Pretty soon you're, you're starting to think, um, you're, you're starting to really resent this other person. Because, and, it, and is it the other person's fault that I don't have the courage to, to, um, to go ahead and, and confront that? It's my fault. In fact, I'm encouraging it. And, when even, and I even recognized I was doing it. But I wasn't sure how to get out of it. And so it got to the point where the resentment just built and built and built and built. And I finally just said, oh my gosh, I've got to do something about this. So I went back through my books again. I read everything again. And, um, and I started the process of confronting this person with as much respect as I possibly could. But I did have to manage that person out of the organization. Um, now, I'm very glad. I know that I couldn't have done any more than I did. So I feel good about that. I don't feel good about having to let someone go. I hate that. That's one of the parts of my job I really, really hate. But guess what? If you're going to be a successful leader, that's part of the deal. And, um, and I actually, during this, during this time period, I actually wore a bracelet that said courage. And I just kept looking at my bracelet. I've got to have courage. But I don't want to have so much courage that I stop treating this person with respect. Because that's the trade-off. You've constantly got to, got to remember that that person is a human being and that person deserves respect. Now, anyone want to share with us? You will get a book. OK, so right over here. Which go one? with you first. You can both share. So this summer I worked at CR England Trucking and I was in the call center. So I talked to people who were applying for jobs or coming into the truck driving school. And I heard how everyone else talked to these truckers when I first started working there. And I'm like, you guys are really mean. Like, do they really deserve that? Until I started talking to them myself. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I sound like a 12 year old on the phone, so that probably doesn't help me out. But I was really nice to them. I'd be like, oh, well, let's look at your application, you know. And I'd get to their personal history and be like, you have a felony for killing somebody. So <laughs> we can't really hire you. And they would freak out on me. And I just didn't have the courage to be like, well, that's a never hire. I'd be like, well, try back in you know, like 10 years or something. <laughs> but I didn't have the courage because I'm like, they're yelling at me. I'm like, well, yeah, maybe try back again. But I just couldn't ever tell them no. Right. And then it took me to like the end of the summer. But I'd call people and be like, yep, you just don't qualify. It's part of our policy. So I was like professional, I had the confidence, and I was considerate. And then it was kind of like, it was a learning experience for sure. Perfect example. I think we need to give her a clap for that one. Well awesome. Done. OK, which book would you like? Uh, Seven Okay. Good choice. Great book. OK, tell us yours. All right. So um, last year, I worked for a, family, for a family business. I went down to Texas to help them. And I was one of the general managers of a team about 16. And who I reported to was my stepdad, and he was the operations manager. So as his GM, I felt it was one of my responsibilities to increase productivity, efficiency. Um, I did a lot of the hiring as well. And so I had a lot, interact a lot with staff. And uh, there was a lot of things he wasn't doing in the best way. I felt like there was a more efficient, more productive way to do it. And uh, unfortunately, the only time we had to talk about it was when we got home. Oh, great. So that <laughs> awesome line started to blur between family and work. Right. And uh, I was trying to be as considerate as I could, but nothing was changing and nothing was getting done. And it was actually causing stress within the family. And I was trying so hard to be careful of his feelings and then my mother's feelings and just that odd, awkward relationship within that business family sure. that it eventually just came to a boiling point and it ended up kind of bad. <laughs> so um, definitely understand how it's important to have courage, especially early on. Yes. And to be able to separate. So. Okay, I love that you said to have courage early on. Oh, 
I don't want to get our microphones in competition with each other. Um, because what I found for me is if I, don't, if I don't gather up my courage at the beginning, if I wait, by the time I get the courage, I am so far past consideration. <laughs> and then I start acting on my very worst day when I've just lost it because I'm tired or I'm hungry or you know, a million other things. If you can do it early, and I just love what you said, start courage early. If you can start that courage early, that helps so much because you're still at your best. You're your best self. Now, the other thing that I'd recommend for a family business where you're all blended together in crazy ways is that if someone is the boss and they own the business, you can tell them some things that you think that have to be done differently, but then you say, I understand you're the boss. You get to make that choice. And then when they don't do it, they don't do it. It's their company. They get to choose not to do that. And so if you just keep knocking your head against the wall over and over and over, but you could do so much better, we could sell so much more, you're going to be unhappy and they're going to be unhappy. They're going to be really unhappy and they're going to want to get rid of you which is hard when, you're, when you belong to the family. How do you get rid of the family? It's hard. So one of the things that I recommend is whether it's family or an immediate boss, when you tell them some things that need to be changed, don't ex if they don't change, that's fine. You told them. And now you just keep doing what you're paid to do. And you let them make those decisions because they're the ones that has to make that decision. And yes, it can be very, very frustrating to do that. But it's even more frustrating when you keep pushing and you don't have the responsibility to make the change. And you're trying to get them to change and they don't want to change. Or they're not willing to change or they can't change. Sometimes they don't have the ability to change. OK, so let's look at our next one. High courage, low consideration. Was that one over here? OK, back here. Let's get you a mic first. So, oh, thank you. So I was working on a project with another guy, and we, we were in charge of about a group of about 30 people. And each individual, they were set up in pairs, and they, each pair had certain responsibilities of things that they had to do. Um, and we had a great plan. Everything was all set out. We knew how it was going to be done. Um, but then as time slowly progressed, we, we saw that these people weren't really motivated. They weren't, they weren't really attached to the same vision that we were. We, the great potential that we saw things coming along. And so we just kind of threw them out of the picture and we ended up doing everything ourselves. They were still part of the group, but we ended up doing their jobs. We, we did everything. And then as time went on, we saw that they started to undermine us. They weren't really supportive. And so when the actual event came, it was terrible <laughs> because we didn't have their support. They weren't there to do the things that they were assigned to do. And we couldn't do everything ourselves, which we thought we could. And so high, high courage because we were able to go out and do things, but we were in low consideration because we weren't really thinking of them and how much help they were going to be. OK, great. Great um, example. And that happens all the time, doesn't it? I mean, you're not, this isn't rare. Guess what? You're in really good company. Um, a lot of us have a lot of high courage. Ever worked in a team project at, at school? You, you're in a group, and uh, three of your people aren't doing anything. But my heck, you're going to get an A. Like, I'm going to get my A. So if I have to do this whole project myself, I'm going to do it myself. And so you do. And, um, and you have high courage, and it's great, you get your A. But how do the members feel about you? <laughs> they probably hate you. Now, someone over here said pretty good, because they're thinking, it's great, you did the work, we're glad. <laughs> okay. Okay, and did you want to keep doing that? No, no. And as a leader, can you sustain that? I can tell you no. You can't. You cannot sustain doing everything yourself. 
And so lot, a lot of, part of being a, a leader, I think especially at your age, is you, had, you do have a lot of courage. You, do, you can figure out how to do it yourself. And you will do it yourself if you have to. But the trick is, to be a good leader, you bring everyone along with you. It is very difficult to do. Um, and sometimes it doesn't always work. And I can tell you that I have had great successes. And I've had horrible failures. Um, but my successes keep me going in, in times when, um, when they don't work out as well. They're not always going to work out as well. But your goal is that you want it to work out the majority of the time, that you're able to, to balance both of those things, that you're able to have that high consideration and high courage together. OK, so our last one is high courage and high consideration. So let me just give you an example of how I, I took a, a low courage or a high courage, um, low consideration, and I was able to move it into uh, a win-win. So I, uh, I've told you that I've made lots of mistakes. And one of the mistakes that I made was um, I got into a power struggle with a dean. I don't recommend that. Um, but I did. I, I got into this power struggle. And as I got into it, I recognized that I was getting into it. And I'm like, I'm thinking, how do I get out of this? I didn't get out of it. Pretty soon, he. He and I are just at each other's throats. Um, both of us are having very, very high courage and very low consideration. And, um, and, and, it, and it's not going to end well. So, um, so I finally decide, OK, I have got, I'm the one who has to change here. I have got to figure this out. I did the same thing again. I went through my books. I went through them again. And I, I decided, I've got to fix this. So, I decided I'm going to have to apologize. So I picked a time when um, I, I saw him in the cafeteria, and I just went up to him and I said, I am so sorry. I would like to have a do-over. And when I went up to him, like when he first saw me, he is just like, his whole body goes rigid. Like, I am the enemy. And he is like in hostile mode. And um, his whole body is just rigid. And, um, and so I, I said, and I was sincere. I really wanted to make this right. Um, he was very surprised when I did that. And I said, I would like to come to your office. I'd really like to understand what the problems are. And, and what he had said is, um, we were trying to do more recruiting. And we wanted, we wanted that area to work with us in recruiting. And we needed some of the faculty to help us. And, um, and basically, he had said, no, and I'm not going to let any of my faculty or any of my people uh, do any recruiting. And so we had gotten in this power struggle. So anyway, I said, let me come to, my, let me come to your office. Let me understand what, you know, what obstacles that you have, and, and can I just understand the problem? He said, yes, I could. So I went into the office. And, um, and I was trying to decide, how do I do this? Now, in Seven Habits, um, you've got habit four that is think win-win, and you've got habit five that is listen to understand before being understood. So I reread the chapter on listening to understand before you understood, you can understand. So I, um, and I never really liked that chapter, and the reason why I didn't is because in the chapter, it says that you, you listen and then you kind of pair it back to that person exactly what they're saying. Does anyone feel... That's awkward. Okay, I felt like it was awkward. And so I never really liked it. Uh, because I always felt like, well, that's so unnatural for me to do that. Um, but I reread the chapter again, and I thought, you know, I think because we are in such a standoff, probably that's the only thing I can say. Um, if you're not in such a high stakes position, you can say a lot of things, especially if you have a relationship. But I think I had, I had damaged the relationship so much that I decided that probably the only thing I probably could say was just whatever he said to me. So I thought, OK, I'm going to give this a try. So, um, so I came in, and, and I said, I'm here to listen. I just want to understand your department and what you need. So he started talking. You know, my faculty are too busy. Um, and, and he talked for about 15 minutes. And I would say, 
your faculty are too busy. And they cannot help you, and he would talk and talk and talk, and I said, and they cannot help us. I mean, like, I just, I just stuck right with what he said, because I was like, anything I say can and will be held against me. <laughs> so for an hour, I did that. For an hour, all I did was just listen intently and then just repeat back what he said. And then at the end of the hour, um, he said, well, it, our time is up. And I said, OK, <laughs> looks like our time is up. And um, I, I said, why don't I said, let me think about these things, and maybe I can come back to you with some ideas. He said, OK. So I, I left, and I, and I went back to my office, and I'm thinking, I don't think that helped at all. So, um, so anyway, I went back to my office, and I'm thinking, I don't think that helped at all. Um, I don't think we made any progress at all. So um, I decided, I, I waited for about two weeks, and then I went back. And uh, when I came in, I said, now, I, I've kind of looked at the problems. One thing that you said is that your faculty can't help. So I'm thinking that what we could do for this particular event is we wouldn't have to use faculty. We could use advisors. Anyway, I just went down each single point and everything that I could think of, and I had brainstormed with the people that I work with, what could we do to meet this, this obstacle? And he said, OK, uh, you know, let's try doing that. So I'm thinking, awesome, this is awesome. Well, here's the, here is the most amazing thing. Sincerely, all I did was listen. And now he is like one of our biggest supporters. Anytime he can help, he helps. The faculty help. They all help. I didn't even ask for that. What I did was I sincerely listened. I, I was able to, um, you know, calm down my pride and, and be humble and ask for, um, basically let him know that I was sorry, ask for his forgiveness, and turn over a new leaf. And it completely turned into a win-win. I never thought that would happen, ever. So now, when I am in a very high-stakes situation, an angry, angry situation, I do use that. I just repeat exactly what they say back to me, instead of trying to say, but, you know, have you heard of this, or what about this, or... Why do you feel that way? And it really, really works. How many of you have had a win-win situation where you really felt good about it? There's got to be more than this. Did you have your hand raised? In the back. Would you be willing to tell us about it? OK. Um, can I just ask you, pretty please, to come up here? Pretty, pretty, pretty please. You're awesome. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. OK, so like you, I had a situation that I was very high courage, low consideration. I went in to someone, said some pretty hurtful things that I later felt really badly about. And so I went in later with high consideration, high courage, all that, and just apologized to him and um, kind of tried to make things right, and I didn't really know how things had ended. I was still pretty unsure about our relationship. And just a week ago, I saw this person again for the first time since then, and it was amazing how me apologizing and going in kind of like humbled and feeling bad for what I had done before it completely changed our relationship back to how it was before, and things are good now, and yeah. Awesome. Let's give her a hand. Now, I'm not saying that every time you apologize, it's going to work out great, because it doesn't always work out great. But I am saying that if you sincerely apologize, you're going to have a much higher chance of working something out than if you don't. And being able to work that out and have a win-win situation, it is one of the best feelings ever. When you handle a situation well, it feels so good. And when you handle a situation poorly, how does it feel? <laughs> awful. Just awful. When I handle a situation poorly, I just hate it. And I dwell on it, and I think about it, and I can't sleep, and I just hate it. And I want to do better. And, um, and the whole point, and the thing I love about, about the books that I shared with you, is that it helps you learn how to be your best self on your worst day. And if you're going to be a successful leader and someone pays you 
to be a successful leader or they pay you to be the CEO of the company, they're paying you for your worst days, not your best days. And that's critical. So finally, I have one of these little charts. I have it at my desk. It helps me remember. It helps me think. Where am I at right now? If I'm struggling, I look at the chart and I think, am I in a lose-win? Am I in a lose-lose? It's surprising how many times I find myself that I'm really in the wrong because it's so easy to always think it's the other person's fault. It's, it's not our fault. How can it possibly be our fault? Because we're so awesome. So if you learn how to master the high-stakes communication, you will never have to walk away from something without um, feeling like you can't face a problem. You will be able to face those problems that come your way. And I can promise you that as you move up in leadership and how, as you take on more and more responsibility, you get more and more problems. You get problems that are unsolvable. And you get new ones every single day. And if you have these kind of skills behind you, instead of getting totally overwhelmed or even um, paralyzed, have you ever had been paralyzed? I have. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do, so you don't do anything. Um, instead of getting paralyzed, you can get some energy and you can confront what you need to confront. Okay, I want to tell you I've really enjoyed um, speaking with you today. You are a great group and I wish you the very best of luck. Thank you. Thank you.